My name is Nancy Benson, and I want to thank all of you so much for coming this evening. Um, I'm going to make a little bit longer intro than normal, just because this is our last event of Capture 2017. And um, anyway, I just uh, wanted to say for myself, just a member of the community, a member of the city, I just think it's outstanding what the people that work at Capture have done the leadership, the growth of this in four years, the amount of completely accessible, amazing stuff happening. And uh, so I just want to really, from the bottom of my heart, thank everyone that's worked so hard and everyone that's come out and supported this, because this is what makes a city great. And I think um, all of us being here, we're making our city greater. Capture. Thank you for all coming tonight. Camera Lucida. There is perhaps no more famous book on photography than Roland Barthes' seamlessly written, wonderfully illustrated, and annotated intimate account of the photograph. Since its publication in 1980, its influence has been huge. Everybody knows something about the punctum and the studium. Yet Camera Lucida has largely escaped capture even by its best and closest interpreters, primarily because the punctum's curious relationship to time has escaped attention. The punctum is more than a point in time, a subjective whim or something detached from the photographer's intentions. It needs to be read against the hijacking of memory and a vast shortening of time perpetrated by photography but also as integral to the sweeping logic of Camera Lucida itself that is best captured in the phrase, attention toward the future, something tethered specifically to memory, continuity, and allegory. The reasons for the misreception of Barth's text are many. The textual shifts from philosophy to playful speculation onto personal reflection, mourning for his mother, and lastly, the obdurate nature of the photographic examples themselves all of which have a life of their own redoubled by the captions, like this one, have posed awkward problems for interpreters. Further, with so much writing by its prodigious author, it has proven difficult for respondents to stay focused on the book itself. Barth as mythologist, structuralist, semiologist, or Lacanian is so pervasive that the Barth of Camera Lucida rarely shows up. Most interesting in regard to these vagaries of misinterpretation is the Barth who glories in his own missteps. This is the Barth at war with the studium and beset by the creaturely desires and obsessions of the punctum. On the one hand, there is the apparently gay Barth, held by a man's posture and pretty face. Taken by Maplethorpe's hand at the right degree of openness, the right density, density of abandonment not fooled by the incongruous gesture of a touching hand, though pricked by the crossed arms of another and admitting to his aberrant desires all along. On the other hand, there is the Barth who continually is drawn to hands. This is Barth the fetishist who sees Zara's large hands, the bandaged finger of Heinz's child from an institution or that of Barth's mother at the age of five in the famous Winter Garden photograph, quote, holding one finger in the other hand as children often do, end quote. He obsesses over the long nails of the man photographed by Nadar, notes the fingernails of a Sandinista, Zara's dirty nails, or Warhol's spatulate nails. Drawn in by the detail, it is uncertain whether this is Barth casting about for metaphors of the photographic enterprise a la Walter Benjamin, for whom the click of the shutter by the photographer's finger was a harbinger of death, or Barth working hard to root out a symptomatology within himself. Part one of the book luxuriates in interpretive missteps and is in fact best approached as the narration of the author's very pragmatic trial and error process of writing about the photograph. The Barth of part one is on the wrong path, and not until his recantation, his palinode, in part two will things be put right, or almost. The change of direction, or better, the conversion that takes place between the two halves of the book is nothing less than miraculous. No surprise, 
that the two carnal desires of part one are left behind for a hyperbolic version of courtly love restricted to the mother in part two. If we are ever to come to terms with Barth's camera lucida, a range of misinterpretations must be cleared from the table and fundamental questions brought to the fore. By staying as close to the text as possible, I aim to reveal that the interpretive complexities of the punctum blur effortlessly with the larger stakes of the book. As part of this, I suggest the variable iterations of the punctum relating to desire and the fetish in part one serve as a minor analytic of time. I suggest the second version of the punctum introduced in part two relates to the radical cropping back of time. And lastly, I show that the basic iterations of the punctum in parts one and two are shot through by a broader question of time that is tethered to conversion and a much larger theological machinery. I call the system of reversals involving life and death and past and future, which support and sustain this fundamentally Christian conversion narrative, a Christ event without Christ that is integral to the development of allegory in the modern period. This raises a point about Barth's unique version of theory in Camera Lucida, which I would call thematic criticism. Very few critics have come to terms with the exigencies of Barth's thematic criticism, a, th a criticism that is not keyed to any general notion of photography, but to the content of singular photographs. In fact, it's tempting to say that for Barth, photography is itself a kind of thematic container that is criticism. The great threat Barth's critical project faces is the worry that it is unable to pass on to the reader this content within the form provided. For instance, what if the mix of heat and steam rising from Stieglitz's horses goes up in smoke? I suggest Barth's fear is well-founded, but is also allayed by the special relationship between allegory and theological conversion, which overcomes this inadequacy. In order that we might see Camera Lucida as a set of differential arcs toward the future, allow me to briefly summarize the key points of part one with special attention to basic presuppositions and logic, time, and the photographs themselves. For a critic who once pronounced the death of the author and the birth of the reader, it's important to see that Barth needs to make a lot of strategic moves to get his argument up and running. But then Barth's dictum never authorized a no-holds-barred version of interpretation. Rather, the death of the author and the birth of the reader spoke to the sacrosanct relationship between a, a reader and a unique text. To begin with, Barth refuses to address anything resembling the medium of photography, hence the recourse to the photograph with a capital P. Keying his criticism to singular photographs, he says photography is unclassifiable. He argues that what the photograph reproduces to infinity has occurred only once, that the photograph is a pure dectic language, that a photograph is always invisible, that it is not it that we see. And finally, that what is required is something of a new science for each object, a mathesis singularis. Very few commentators have taken any of these statements to heart, and they only set the terms of engagement. Second, Barth makes himself the measure or mediator of photography. This is the critic who ignores the photographer and who asks, what does my body know of photography? The critic who decides to take as a guide for analysis the attraction I felt for certain photographs, and that what this attraction amounted to was advenience or even adventure. This picture advenes, this one doesn't. Third, alongside the hint to Christian hermeneutics in Advene, Barth aligns his project with a vague, casual, even cynical phenomenology, and claims his irreducible interest lies with an effective intentionality. Finally, building on this foundation that addresses issues interior to experience as much as exterior to experience, Barth introduces his famous distinction between the studium and the punctum. He pauses on a photograph by Cohn Wessings and asks, did this photograph please me? interest me, intrigue me, not even. Simply, it existed for me. So begins the critic's discussion of the punctum, which has captured so much critical attention. 
He writes, quote, a photograph made me pause, nothing very extraordinary. The, banali the banality of rebellion in Nicaragua, a ruined street, two helmeted soldiers on patrol, behind them, two nuns. I understood at once that its existence, its adventure, derived from the co-presence of two continuous elements, heterogeneous in that they did not belong to the same world, the soldiers and the nuns, end quote. It's easy to get lost in this initial introduction to the punctum. In fact, getting lost is the crux. Working meta-theoretically, we can say that the power of the punctum is the way it joins two heterogeneous worlds, which is a first good working definition of allegory. To key this to the question of time specifically, we can say that the photograph gives him time to wonder, or as Barth says, it makes him pause. He becomes absorbed or lost in thought, which should be understood as a movement between the two worlds of the nuns and soldiers. More simply still, the photograph gives him time. Again, this is the time to wonder, a word whose etymology goes back to the roots of philosophy with Aristotle's notion of thaumazine. How is time given? As some of you will know, the definition of the punctum is inseparable from the condition of the studium, the one haunting the other in Derrida's famous description. Barth suggests that whereas the studium is bound to the quote, the very wide field of unconcerned desire, of various interest, of inconsequential taste, or of the order of liking, the punctum's weight or pressure is that of loving, end quote. This difference noted, their relation is a slippery one. If at one moment the punctum is distinct from the machinations of desire, ideology, or dispositives, at other moments the punctum is subject to them. This confusion is sorted out in Derrida's reading of the punctum, which also happens to isolate Barth's notion of the performative. Thus Derrida says, quote, the punctum plays the subtle beyond of the studium, end quote. Elsewhere, quote, the punctum, the uncoded beyond, composes with the always coded of the studium, end quote. In short, the kind of time the punctum gives to Barth, the viewer, is unique time, performed by himself alone. It is what makes him who he is at that particular juncture of time. This is made clear later in part two where he writes, henceforth, I would have to consent to combine two voices, the voice of banality, to say what everyone sees and knows, and the voice of singularity, to replenish such banality with all the elan of an emotion which belonged only to myself. It was as if I were seeking the truth of a verb which had no infinitive, only tense and mode. This is precisely the power of the speech act. What is at stake is Barth's version of the performative. This performative edge on the punctum should help untangle the short list of Wessing's works Barth talks about. In each case, the punctum shifts, primarily because he is a close reader whose criticism is keyed to singular photographs. And Barth knows very well that the performative is only animated when one responds to singular images. A good thing to keep in mind if you want to talk the talk as well as walk the walk of performatives. With its introduction in section nine in the extended discussion that follows, we see nothing less than an analytic of the ways and means by which the photograph animates Barth. As a legion of critics have rehearsed before me, the punctum will, quote, break or will punctuate the studium. It is not I who seek it out, as I invest the field of the studium with my sovereign consciousness, it is this element which rises up from the scene, shoots out of it like an arrow, and pierces me. A Latin word exists to designate this word, this prick, this, sorry, this wound, this prick, this mark made by a pointed instrument, end quote. In all of these examples, the punctum acts upon him. It is Barth's version of the photographic act. This, quote, sting, speck, cut, little hole, and also a cast of the dice, end quote, brings him into being 
by precipitating an equal and opposite act within him. This is the dirt that Barth's cynical phenomenology turns up. In Derrida's terse description of this double process, which presumes the act of adopting life, all the while one thinks that one is giving it, quote, the punctum points to me at the instant and place where I point to it. It is thus that the punctum points me, end quote. Along the same line of argument, but this time with the punctum key to the photographer rather than the reader, Barth famously untethers the punctum from the photographer's intentions and further points to a version of the punctum tethered to the person who is being photographed. This compounds an already complex definition that brings on the collusion of history, various techniques whose alibi is shock, and the problem of mythology, whether the Nadar's French bourgeoisie, Sanders' Germans of pre-Nazi Germany, or Avedon's New York's upper crust. Ultimately, Barth concludes, quote, photography is subversive, not when it frightens, repels, or even stigmatizes, but when it is pensive, when it thinks, end quote. As I've already suggested, the capacity of a photograph to think should be framed by the larger notion of the photographic act, which is in turn intimately linked to a thinking subject and hence is necessarily framed by an exchange of properties and characteristics that happens primarily between the photograph and the viewer, but also between the subject and the camera, and the photographer and the subject. The most important of these chiasmic exchanges, that's what they are, involves life and death between the viewer and photograph. In his most transparent moment, Barth writes, quote, In this glum desert, suddenly a specific photograph reaches me. It animates me, and I animate it, end quote. But Barth deploys and expands this basic couplet in a way that is truly expansive. For example, there is the unspoken but necessary opposition in hearing in Charles Clifford's habitable photograph, where being there at the Alhambra infers a leave-taking in the here and now. This sets Barth off on a quest to determine the variable tenses of the photograph. He writes... This longing to inhabit is phantasmatic, deriving from a kind of second sight which seems to bear me forward to utopian time, or to carry me back to, to somewhere in myself, a double movement which Baudelaire celebrated." End quote. I read the string of examples that follow thick and fast on Barth's admission as an attempt to parse phantasmatic pasts from phantasmatic futures. And it is very important to note Barth's use of the phantasmatic here as a categorically different sense of time with a far larger dialectical reach attached to allegory will be introduced in the second part of the book. Thus, if phantasmatic time stretches or elongates the time of the present, it is also a curbing or shortening of time relative to the continuity of time instanced through classical allegory, which is always more than present and always larger than simple referentiality. The list of phantasmatic longings begins by looking backward, with the horizon of Barth's own childhood and upbringing providing the basic leverage. Thus there is the example of the ill-bred punctum and children in Klein's Little Italy, in particular the boy's bad teeth. There is Barth's obsession with uncleanly hands and nails, which gestures back to the subject's upbringing by virtue of his own. Finally, there, did, there is Cortege's The Violinist's Tune and Barth's unforgettable response. Quote, I recognize with my whole body the straggling villages I passed through on my long ago travels in Hungary and Romania. End quote. For a while, I entertained doing some research into whether Barth did in fact spend some time in the region, but of course he hadn't. It, I was, as he was, in the seductive grip of the phantasmatic past. What is important to realize later on is that in Barth's finely tuned argument, the punctum for the viewer follows exactly in the footsteps of the punctum for the photographer. The key phrases are the photographer's second sight and Barth's thinking eye. 
Listen for the way he strings them together like the cart track that seems to run under our feet. He writes, quote, the photographer's second sight does not consist in seeing, but in being there. Above all, imitating Orpheus, he must not turn back to look at what he is leading, what he is giving to me, end quote. And then following, quote, the thinking eye, which makes me add something to the photograph, is the dirt road. Its texture gives me the certainty of being in Central Europe, end quote. It is for this reason that Barth tells us the punctum is a supplement, and further, that it is, quote, an addition. It is what I add to the photograph and what is nonetheless already there. But we should be even more specific and say that the punctum, when retrospective in nature, is not simply an addition or something we add on, so much as add under or before. This is why Barth says this species of punctum, when, quote, linked to a detail, to a detonator, end quote, does not, quote, make us dream, end quote, but instead makes us live. It provides us with something like a real memory, as well as the semblance of the experience that goes with it. In effect, then, Barth steals memory from the photograph, as well as the experience that goes with it. This is Barth being very theoretical. For here the punctum provides us with the semblance of a memory of the past by using photography as a mnemotechnic, or external memory aid. Thus, in part two, Barth will say, quote, not only is the photograph never in essence a memory, but it actually blocks memory, quickly becomes a counter memory, end quote. And, quote, one day some friends were talking about their childhood memories. They had any number, but I, who had just been looking at my old photographs, had none left, end quote. In all cases, the photograph literally serves as a prosthetic extension of the self allowing the apparatus of memory to operate using an external substrate instead of an internal foundation and even crowding out these memories. Furthermore, this prostheticization is based on the pattern of an allegorical relation of joining two texts and a point on which I think we should detect Barth's reading of Benjamin's Little History of Photography. One of the reasons Barth includes Kurtage's photograph in Camera Lucida, is that stealing memory from photography literally departs from Benjamin's paranomatic thoughts on Atje's photographs that he describes as the scene of a crime, and in terms of theft, the relation between the French word vol and violin, and finally, kleptomania. In face of photography, Barth recognizes he is a kleptomaniac, like Benjamin, both constantly steal memories from photography, and photography steals their memories in turn. The phantasmatic past is replaced by a phantasmatic future in this photograph, which Barth says is dominated by a floating flash. Wilson's hold on Barth is an unlocatable punctum with a forward leaning trajectory that amounts to Barth's desire to meet the man in the flesh. Finally, there is Barth's comparison of film and photography, which bears upon what he calls the blind field. The screen, quote, as Bazin has remarked, is not a frame but a hideout. The man or woman who emerges from it continues living, end quote. Thus the figures in this photograph are not nailed down. By virtue of the punctum, they live on, kick, and fly up. This is the after effect of G.W. Wilson's Queen Victoria. For what if the horse bucks in the very next instant? I imagine that what amused Wolf was one old nag sitting on another, while Barth's blind field of a moment later isolates the lightning fast equivalents struck between what we glimpse beneath the Harry Scotsman kilt. Harry Scotsman's kilt and Her Majesty's skirt, the additional irony being that the head of the foundered horse with slumping hindquarters upon which the queen sits is not being held down by the groom but held up. This phallic chain of signifiers is a specific example of the add-on or snap-on technology of the projective punctum 
which happens on top of an existing image as well as beside it because it has duration built into it. The second half of Camera Lucida has a very different purchase on time than the slippages in temporal duration that seen in part one. The effective economy of the present that rewrites the immediate past and authors the near future as part of a desiring machine is reconceptualized and sharpened by virtue of what he calls the punctum of time. In Barth's words, this new punctum, which is no longer of form but of intensity, is time, the lacerating emphasis of the noem that has been, its pure representation. In short, and time is short for Barth of Camera Lucida, the phantasmatic elongation of the present into the immediate past and near future is variously cropped and clipped back to a temporal bracket that includes only an absolute past and present. For Barth, the essence of the photograph, the noem that has been, is the revolving door between past and present. This vastly reduced temporal bracket is the basic backdrop for the critical machinery Barth puts to work in the text and galvanizes around allegory and the so-called winter garden photograph. The main locus for Barth's discussion of this new punctum is Alexander Gardner's portrait of Louis Payne. This picture, taken uh, a picture taken sometime before um, Payne was hung for his part in Lincoln's assassination. Of Gardner's portrait, Barth writes, quote, the photograph is handsome, as is the boy. That is the studium. But the punctum is, he is going to die. I read at the same time, this will be, and this has been. I observe with horror an in anterior future of which death is at stake. Is at stake. To briefly and sharply characterize this new punctum, we can say that memory, as attention toward the future, is substituted for an anterior future, which is a death that happens sometime between the past and the present. Here, futurity is disabled by a present, which offers no path forward. The punctum of time merely exists as an empty bridge that connects two texts across time, as every allegory does, and more importantly, cuts time by a third in such a way that futurity is negated. But things are more complex than this, for these musings on Gardner's portrait amount to a kind of skepticism that denies the anagogical sense of religious hermeneutics, or if you wish, messianic time, as Benjamin would call it. Certainly this pressure on the future is shot through with social unrest and the popular nihilism of the 70s, but Barth's real concern is not only the loss of hope as well as death pure and simple, but the end of the possibility of continuance. After having discovered the Winter Garden photograph, Barth writes, quote, I could do no more than await my total undialectical death, end quote. Elsewhere, quote, each photograph contains this imperious sign of my future death, end quote. Or, quote, the photograph tells me death in the future. What pricks me is the discovery of this equivalence. And lastly, with a kind of finality that precious few of Barth's readers want to hear, or simply ascribe to a constitutive difference with the medium of cinema, the photograph, quote, is without future, end quote. In it, no preten pretensity, end quote. The weight of Barth's argument for memory, allegory, and continuance through futurity is forwarded through a labyrinth of textual arguments, but there are also a number of photographs which we can lean on to show this more quickly. Thus, Niepce's The Dinner Table, which a yeah. caption tells us is the first photograph. The contrarian in me can't help but read this first photograph as the Last Supper. And because the Last Supper preceded the crucifixion, the first photograph of the Last Supper amounts to a mass crucifixion of us all by the photograph. Barth says as much, writing, quote, photography has something to do with resurrection. Might we not say of it what the Byzantines said of the image of Christ, which impregnated St. Veronica's napkin, that it was not made by the hand of man, end quote. This is consolidated slightly later in the text when we are told that the light that life amidst photography amounts to the conditions of what Barth calls 
life death. Life death should not be understood as the simple click, quote, separating the initial pose from the final print, which Barth tells us. More importantly, photography provides a perverted form of life that is modeled on life after death, that is, life in and as a constant resurrection through photography. The problem being that the past photography gives us is not a foundation we can truly move upon. Thus he describes the present perfect tense as, quote, the grammatical expression of memory, whereas the tense of the photograph is the hourist, end quote, or what in classical Greek expresses an impotent past action. For Barth, photography makes zombies of us all. Without the ability to perform the unique time of the punctum, mass culture gets the better of us. Another moment where we see the temporal impasse of photography in an especially crisp way is in the example of Nadar's The Artist's Mother or Wife. What Barth calls, quote, one of the loveliest photographs in the world, a superrogatory photograph, end quote. It is one of the loveliest for a number of reasons. Most importantly, because it is uncertain as to whether it is Nadar's mother or wife. This ambivalence, which is the result of a temporal instability, is a pattern that Barth experienced with his own aging mother. Barth writes, quote, During her illness, I nursed her, held the bowl of tea she liked, because it was easier to drink from than a cup. She had, by, she become, she had become my little girl uniting for me with the essential child she was in her first photograph, end quote. This anecdote is important because Barth finds the photograph to be a reflecting chamber that moves between past and present. The inversion of the mother-child relationship to the child-mother is a distillation of photographic time. In the crisscross notion of the mother-wife, mother-daughter, or daughter-mother then, Barth frames the photograph as a back and forth movement of mutually exclusive narratives. The point being that even in one of the loveliest photographs in the world, the photograph makes things move from past to present and then back again. Death interrupts the, the flow of time in such a way that the future is not equated with living on, but with looking backward from the end of the line. Barth writes, Quote, I who had not procreated, I had in her very illness engendered my mother, end quote. This inverse structure marks a limit within the photograph for which there is no outside. In fact, Barth frames the problem of looking as nothing less than falling into the abyss of empty time, separating past from present. This is what Barth earlier calls the pure representation of time, a point Bernard Stiegler interprets to mean that the camera is a seeing clock and cinema its literalization. Nadar's mother-wife matters because the clock time of photography is read into, backward as it were, by the viewer. Thus, quote, what founds the nature of photography is the pose, the term of an intention of reading, end quote. This amounts to saying that when life conjures meaning out of the clock time of the photograph, the upshot is not death pure and simple, but the cancelling out of death with life. In this sense, the narration of death is doubled by an equal and opposite reading, which amounts to the writing of a life, but not a unique life. For this double-edged movement describes a performance of reading that is eaten up in the process of its performance, not a performative then, but another angle on life-death. The failure of all but a few critics to isolate the temporal subtleties of the photograph as a closed structure or reflective chamber resembling a camera obscura amounts to a blindness to the way in which Barth believes transmission and continuance are both blocked and potentially furthered by the reader. In the time remaining, I'll show how Barth leans on allegory to move things toward what he calls the beyond of all closed systems, end quote. In the Winter Garden photograph, he finds a way to open up the temporal bracket of the photograph to a past 
which will in turn lead to a robust future. This will involve fixing the malfunctioning performative implicit to the majority of photographs. Part two begins, quote, now one November evening shortly after my mother's death, I was going through some photographs. I had no hope of finding her, end quote. And a few pages later, there I was, alone in the apartment where she had died, and I found it, end quote. As is well known, the Winter Garden photograph with Barth's mother at age five is never shown. It is distinct from an array of textual examples which hinge on the concomitance of past and present. For instance, Barth says, history is what separates him from the many photographs of his mother. He writes, quote, the life of someone whose existence has somewhat preceded our own encloses in its particularity the very tension of history, its division. History is hysterical. It is constituted only if we consider it, only if we look at it, and in order to look at it, we must be excluded from it, end quote. More complexly, Barth directs us to the ways in which the details of his collection of photographs variously animate his mother. Barth calls this, quote, love's dreadful regime, end quote. For, prior to finding the Winter Garden photograph, he tells us that no photograph, photograph animated her in her entirety, but only in fragments or almost. Thus, quote, the brightness of her eyes. But even these windows to the soul are limited, for ultimately, in the Winter Garden photograph, he finds her complete. For once, Barth writes, photography gave me a sentiment as certain as remembrance, end quote. The capacity of the Winter Garden photograph to capture Barth's mother in her entirety, as well as to wound Barth, as only the punctum can, is an expansion upon the consecutive punctum we tracked in Kertesz's The Violinist's tune. tune. A sequence of chiasmic exchanges link the punctum felt by Barth when looking at the photograph to a prior punctum anchored in the gap separating the beloved figure from the camera, and lastly, to a punctum that separates Barth's mother from herself. This signifying chain that leads from a sign to a sign that precedes it, or from a punctum to a punctum that precedes it, is diagrammed here as the structural transmission of a truth over time by virtue of photography. The fidelity of one punctum to the next is the crux. The alignment between the two chiasms ensures the passing on of real content through a slippery extension of, quote, the force of law that binds the first. In the hundreds of photographs where such alignment fails, what Leotard calls a different intercedes, and the separate events remain irreconcilable, inaccessible. But the justesse of the Winter Garden photograph is different. The perfect alignment of the chiasms on either side of the photograph warrant what Barth calls, quote, the impossible science of unique being, end quote. What is important to note is that the hermeneutic logic of the Winter Garden photograph works according to the successive structure of allegory, specifically classical allegory, as inherited from the church fathers and passed down through Dante, um, Dante's fourfold sense. In this hermeneutic, the old law is the figure of the new law, which is itself the figure of future glory. The literal sense, upon which the allegorical sense is conceived, is based on the allegorical sense narrowly conceived. Allegory in its broadest sense points to what succeeds it, what is within and beyond the narrow sense, that is, its instancing as a moment of conversion, or a Christ event that contains an anagogical future. In Barth's Winter Garden photograph, the Christian metaphor of conversion, which is linked to autobiography, is transformed into the founding moment of the subject, a moment of self-origination in front of the photograph, with the viewer assuming the role of a new savior on the model of the old savior. This is what Andrei Varminsky would call an incarnational model of language.
and it applies to most arguments for photography today. And neither does any of this mean we should understand the encounter in religious terms. The conversion marked by the Winter Garden photograph is a secular conversion, made possible by language, though dependent on a narrative with all the machinery of religious conversion intact. We should also note that classical allegory provides a vastly expanded notion of time than we have yet explored. It explodes the elastic present of phantasmatic time and the photograph's restrictive temporal bracket. Finally, we should add that this is another moment where we feel the presence of Benjamin, specifically his notion of aura found in the New Haven fishwife. The transparency of one punctum to a second and third punctum allows Barth to establish a supercharged notion of aura that traverses extra ground than Benjamin and through other means than his materialist history of the early medium. Another worthwhile comparison is Derrida's description of the oratic nature of the consecutive punctum in terms of what he calls Barth's metaphysics of touch. Here, Derrida aims to spotlight the ghosts of immediacy and presence that still haunt Camera Lucida and which are focused in the punctum. Listen especially for how Derrida pushes Barth's reading heavy analysis toward writing. Derrida writes, quote, time, the metonymy of the instantaneous, the possibility of the narrative magnetized by its own limit, end quote. I think this somewhat cryptic and telescopic sentence goes a long way in characterizing Barth's investment in allegory, but does so by foregrounding Derrida's own bird's eye perspective on the fullness of the written sign, its metonymic proximity to the emptiness of spacing, and hence to the instancing of narrative outside itself. But none of this loses track of Barth the reader, always in media res, or moving through the middle of things or always in the present, that is particularly charged with the metonymics of past and future. In effect, then, what we see here are the subtleties of emphasis that differentiate Barth on reading photography from Derrida on the grammatology of writing. This raises two final points about Camera Lucida that have received far too little attention in the literature. In the first place, Barth's curious discussion of genetics, lineage, and ancestry this begins with a discussion of family. Barth writes, quote, in a certain photograph, I have my father's sister's look, end quote. Elsewhere, his grandmother on his grandmother's side, end quote, her son, my uncle, end quote, is confused with, quote, my mother and myself, end quote. Or a picture of Barth's, quote, father as a child, nothing to do with him as a man, connects his face to my grandmother's and to mine, end quote. This, it, quote, is the truth of lineage, end quote. It, quote, disincarnates the face, manifests its genetic essence, end quote. Or the possibility of a relation to Victor Hugo in Barth's family photo of his mother, quote, and her ancestor, so much the incarnation of the inhuman distance of the stock. In the end, apparently no relation holds fast in the paleogenetic drama of the photograph, as, quote, ultimately, a photograph looks like anyone except the person it represents, end quote, maybe linking Barth and Julia Kristeva. In the family, the extended family, and the family tree, Barth hoped to discern a special kind of, quote, attachment to certain photographs, end quote, that went beyond desire and equaled his attachment to his mother. This is a moment in the text when things shift away from the binary of life and death, to the tension between love and death. Thus, in a passage that has been flagged a number of times by Barth's feminist critics, um, he writes, quote, a sort of umbilical cord links the body of the photograph thing to my gaze. Light, though impalpable, is here a carnal medium, a skin I share with anyone who has been photographed, end quote. This incredible maternal metaphor which moves us immediately into proximity with the origins of reproduction, is at the heart of Barth's interest in genealogy. As Elisa Marder frames the issue in terms of Barth and Christ Christeva's logic, quote, the mother is always on the side of photography, end quote. 
and, in this case, provides the controlling metaphor of what we can identify as Barth's theory of love. But in this theory, which is allegorical through and through, love's chain of reference leads back to the mother, branches out to the mother's brother, the mother and father, Barth's brother, the memory of grandparents, cousins, and so on, ultimately to history as love's protest. For Barth, Michelet's horizon of history is all that undoes the umbilical cord of the mother's love to the extent of cutting it, completely unraveling the thread that is love. In history, the forward arc of allegory is sidetracked by correspondences that resonate like ripples in a pool. History does not move for Barth. It is static and totalizing. Quote, a memory fabricated according to positive formulas, a pure intellectual discourse which abolishes mythic time, and the photograph is a certain but fugitive testimony, so that everything today prepares our race for this impotence, to be no longer able to conceive duration affectively or symbolically, end quote. Unlike the photograph that provides extra memories, history refutes memory, disabling continuity. Recall Barth's paradox. The same century invented history and photography. On this point, it is worth mentioning Eduardo Cadava and Paulo Cortes Roca's notes on love in photography. They argue that the logic of Camera Lucida, quote, belongs to the experience of love, end quote, that, quote, the essence of photography lies in its affirmation of becoming, end quote. And finally, that love is nothing else than a process of disorganization and destabilization, end quote. This is almost right, but not nearly sharp enough. Disorganization and destabilization are far too decentered notions to isolate the allegorical possibility Barth finds in the Winter Garden photograph. The transmission of the past into the present and thence on to a future, along what Barth calls an Ariadne's thread, is a specific kind of love whose principal imperative is attention toward the future, which Barth identifies as a posture what does Barth's notion of posture from the Latin ponere denoting the relation of one thing to another orient us toward? There is a painting by Clay called Angelus Novus, Barth, uh, Benjamin writes, quote, his face is turned toward the past, end quote. Alone among Benjamin's critics, Barth does not emphasize the storm blowing out of paradise or the pile of de debris that grows at the angel of history's feet. Rather, Barth's notion of posture orients us towards something entirely other. Not his mother, per se, nor the institution of the mother, which is of no interest to him, but some unrepresentable essence captured in the Winter Garden photograph. My hunch? For Barth, love ultimately leans on the mother understood as supplementary object, support, or technical prosthesis that grounds ontology, is the foundation of memory, and ultimately the model upon which the photograph, as mnemotechnic, will be substituted. In distinction to, say, Lacan's notion of the mirror stage, or Melanie Klein's emphasis on the breast as part object, Barth directs us to the mother's face as the threshold of the visual world. The precise attachment the photograph produces in Barth reproduces the baby's attempts to grasp the image of its mother's face. This event is the er form of what Barth elsewhere calls, quote, the touche, the occasion, the encounter, the real, in its indefatigable expression, end quote. Posture is crucial to this. And as Michael Fried makes clear in his reading of the place of portrait photography in Camera Lucida, so too is the notion of, quote, facing, Barth's preference, too mild a word, for photographs that look at him, as he puts it, straight in the eye, end quote. As many of you will know, facingness is one more example of an anti-theatrical ideal or animus that Fried would tell us is essential to painting since Manet and part of a much larger history uh, and beyond that.
And as usual, Freed's focus on the anti-theatrical tradition hijacks and silences a lot of absolutely unique questions. Barth's incarnational language, um, first and foremost. But I also think it's clear that Freed's reading points us in the right direction. The aspect I find particularly productive is that like the punctum, which comes attached to what Fried calls an ontological guarantee that it was not intended by the photographer, end quote, Fried argues for a gap built into the problem of facing. Thus, the air of Avedon's portrait of Philip Randolph, which Barth tells us is a separation or distance inhering within any photographic portrait with a frontal pose that can be crossed Barth proposes two solutions as to why this connection or transmission through separation functions. First, he writes, quote, The air, I use this word, lacking anything better for the expression of truth, is a kind of intractable supplement of identity, what is given as an act of grace, stripped of any importance. The air expresses the subject insofar as that subject assigns itself no importance. Second, Barth provides an example drawn from the everyday of a young boy entering a cafe and glancing around. Quote, occasionally his eyes rested on me. I then had the certainty that he was looking at me without, however, being sure that he was seeing me. An inconceivable distortion. How can we look without seeing? Barth's answer, quote, a long quote, the photograph separates attention from perception and yields up only the former, even if it is impossible without the latter. This is that aberrant thing, noesis without noim, an action of thought without thought, an aim without a target. And yet it is this scandalous movement which produces the rarest quality of an air. That is the paradox. How can one have an intelligent air without thinking about anything intelligent? Just be looking into this piece of black plastic. It is because the look, alighting the vision, seems held back by something interior. That lower class boy who holds a newborn puppy against his cheek looks into the lens with his sad, jealous, fearful eyes. What pitiable, lacerating pensiveness. In fact, he's looking at nothing. He retains within himself his love and his fear. That is the look, end quote. In short, Cortez's boy looks at the camera like a newborn infant blankly stares at its mother. Here, portrait photography that looks us straight in the eye stands as an incarnational moment without the presence of Christ because behind the air expressed by the subject, we glimpse something like the first memory. The camera as dumb conduit facilitates the transmission of the old law into the new law but not through the mother's act of reproduction, the dark room equaling the dark womb in Martyr's reading, but rather more in the spirit of Melanie Klein's observations of neonates. She writes, quote, I have seen babies as young as three weeks interrupt their sucking for a short time to look toward her face, end quote. Barth's texts, Text constantly works the fine line between life as seeing the face and death or not seeing the face, and finally, love as seeing the originary face. We see it in Nadar's photograph of his mother or wife, who eats the stems of violets, blissfully unaware in her dementia of anything, let alone being photographed. Allegorical continuance for Barth is based on a remembering that has forgetting built into it which is also why the Winter Garden photograph is not reproduced. It can only be read and not seen. It is a poetic event, neither hidden nor shown, but linked to an act that is repeated. Perhaps hiding in plain sight as a text to be read, like the newborn puppy, metonymically beside Cortez's boy who looks into the lens. And so to conclude, all of this throws a revealing light on Barth's dictum, his famous dictum, that, quote, the birth of the reader must come at the cost of the death of the author, end quote. Has there ever been a clear statement for a conversion narrative ever made 
but never read as such. This is the power of Barth's camera lucida. Or to frame this differently again, with Barth's odd choice of title in mind, the power of the camera lucida over and above the camera obscura is that it does not return us to the first moment we hear music in the dark womb, for instance, or pass through the birth canal to light in the paradigmatic act of reproduction, but restages again and again our assumption to sight, the moment we begin to read the mother's face without the capacity for focal attention, which is the originary photograph, or at least according to Barth. Thanks. Some questions, if there's time? I think there's time. Yeah, thank you. It was a tour de force. For those in the room who don't uh, read a lot of theoretical material around photography, I think this will shift things on their axis a bit. So congratulations. Um, I want to um, address, is it, can you put up a slide, Chef? Yes, sure. The sure. one that says part one and has a horizontal finger along the bottom. Part? Part one. Oh, yes. And the horizontal, it came about a quarter of the way through. Yes. I hope you didn't see a dirty fingernail. I want to check. <laughs> but I, I have a comment on it. Um, it seems to me that if that is the finger of the author, and it may well be, taking a photograph of the page that says page one, then that is a measure of something. And you were talking about Bart measuring in terms, you know, himself in terms of the photograph. And what I see here is the author, you, measuring yourself in terms of the book rather than in terms of the photograph. And uh, there we are. Oh, right, yes. And the, the nail is clean. <laughs> and, I, and I can't judge whether there's an erotics to it, or whether I should, you know, should be a level of desire or not. But it does seem that, that it, it does account for a process that was unacknowledged uh, in what you were doing. Right. In terms of making yourself the measure of the book, as it were. Right. Yeah, I'm, that's nice. I, I included it. <laughs> I, I included it because it's like, it shows me as reader, and I thought it would include yeah. you as reader. And like crucial for me is to animate the sacrosanct relation between text or image and, and viewer for Barth, or text and reader for myself in this case. So, you know, uh, a reiteration of the importance of close reading, of, of performing a reading, which is the only way I think that you can really talk about performatives in any substantive sense. Thanks. Hi. Um, Hi. This is probably not a fully formed question, uh, just a thought that's sort of coming out, um, particularly after you mentioned about seeing face and life and not seeing face and death and love and the seeing. And I wondered about if whether or not um, he had seen his mother when she was dead. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm kind of wondering about what resonates if you don't see somebody who um. is passing from being a living physical body into being a dead physical body. And, and I wonder, too, how this might be caught up in nostalgia and nostalgia more seen as an, an illness or a sickness, as opposed to something that we sort of float around in. Mm. Um, the weird thing about the text is I'm not sure that, you know, his live mother gave him a true remembrance in some respect either. I, I, I'm not sure exactly, right? But I think, like, it's written in such a fluid, autobiographical, easy way that um, I think we can be lulled into a sense of torpor and not understand how deeply structured and theoretically taught the entire argument is. And um, so, you know, I think it, 
I think it, um, um, he uses those, or brings up this incredible image of, or raises the, the possibility of this incredible image that actually, um, you know, gave him a complete remembrance, um, only to um, show how one photograph can actually perform um, this allegorical task of continuance and allegorical, um, or perform or allow for futurity. Because for him, photography, you know, he's not someone that was um, in the art field in the 1980s and 70s and not part of the art market, right? So had no kind of interest in um, salvaging any bit of the emerging um, interest in photography. So he, it's like slash and burn, mostly, when it comes to photography for him. Does that answer your question at all? Uh, I think he's like more interested in in the problem of photography than actual life and death image, life, actual problems of life and death in the book. Because everything is mediated by the language of the photograph for him. And, and it's only the fact that he, he can animate a photograph and it can animate him. It, everything follows from that very strange um, 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 succession of chiasmic reversals and exchanges that um, give a characteristic and take a characteristic back. But um, that was what I was focused on. You should read it yourself and, and yeah. Thanks. Yes, Grant. Uh, thanks. <coughs> this, <coughs> this isn't entirely a question, but <clears throat> it's been a while since I read Cameron Lucida, but it, it always, there was something about it that always really bothered me in the sense that he <laughs> talked about how he arrives at this one photograph which captures the essence. And there's, there's, you know, he makes statements, some of which are repeated about the idea of a true memory. And in a way, it, you know, that, that photograph does, you know, he, the way he describes it carries a certain trace of his mother. But mm -hmm. it always bothered me that his, he kind of dismissed the way that the photographs he would have seen that he didn't initially have a find a punctum in uh, affected his reading of the photograph where he did find that. Mm. Um, and so, so I'm kind of really a bit suspicious of um, as if of that idea of the essence being in this image. I mean, I understand right. he's saying it's for him, yes. but. But that kind of runs through a, a lot of times the way sem semiotics are applied to photographs in the sense that um, it, 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 there's a lot kind of that gets left out. So I'll, maybe I'll just sort of go back to saying that uh, to me that always bothered me that right. he sees that essence in that one image and he kind of dismisses the other ones. And in a way kind of the image that he does connect with is carrying the trace of the photographs he's looked at prior to coming to that one. Mm. Yeah. So. I, just the the, yeah. the 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 focusing of the essence in that singular image just bothered me. I mean, I understand he's talking about it in phenomenological right. well, terms. That's what Derrida's critique of is in the death of Roland Barthes, and that's why he brings up the this this idea of the metaphysics of touch, because you know there's this poetic moment where Barthes says, "The radiant waves of the photograph touch me," or you know, literally touch him. But these are the fictions of being engaged in a, in a circular act of close reading, which doesn't quite cut it for Derrida. So you're, that should bother you, according to Derrida, and me too. I, I, because, but, you know, I get lulled by the beauty and poesy of the whole thing too. But, but that's the critique of Derrida. And, and it's precisely, he calls it the metaphysics of touch, because the photographs, light rays, touch him, not only on the skin, but touch him affectively, which is, you know, on an emotional level, which he really cares about. Yeah. Could it be entirely rhetorical that photographing Well, yes, that's right. Exactly. It, nowhere shown, right? Well, he says, what he says is, for you, for me, a punctum. For you, a studium. 
looking at this photograph, right? But of course, it is. I think it is exactly. It's it's a it's it's a kind of ceiling to which he thinks um, all photography might aspire because, I mean, the whole notion of this kind of um, psychoanalytic engagement with the face of the mother is pretty, you know, speculative stuff as well. It's out there psychoanalytically, right? But um, it's, it's pretty tricky terrain to navigate. But I think that's the terrain he was navigating. And, you know, you see bits of it in, in Julius Kristeva as well. But you're right, it's, um, there's no reason to think there was a photograph. But like all critics like to think that, oh, this photograph is it. No, that this one is it. In a sense, right, I mean, and part of Barth's um, book is it's an archive of images, all of which are a proxy for this originary photograph, right? That's why he includes them. They're entirely shaped by his logical, critical aesthetic, right? There's no, there's no, um, there's no coincidental appearances of any photographs here. They're all completely like um, extensions of like an incredibly tightly written argument and um, for the photograph. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Shep. Let oh. that reverberate through our brains. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll be around for a bit if you have other questions. <laughs>